Hey, good morning, church. Uh, this is again, Johnny hanging out with you today. I have so much to share with you that I am just going to take the time right now to just start diving in. So hopefully you have your Bible. Hopefully you have something to write down and hopefully you're somewhere where you're comfortable. Obviously you're watching this online. Uh, and again, you guys can watch this on Facebook, on YouTube, uh, you can send it to one another. There's always ways of just, hey, I want to share God's word with someone. Just send them the video. What's the worst that can happen? They don't watch it, right? But either way, so today we want to, I want to start by saying this. Have you guys, um, I remember when I was in, in high school, I took a class on media. Now, it wasn't social media because we didn't really have that back then. And yes, I'm dating myself. But we had this class on media. And one of the things that they taught us were, you know, companies use certain phrases, certain language, certain whatever. And there's a reason for it. it. They use it because they want you to be convinced of something, whether it's their product, whether it's what they're trying to get you to, you know, buy. But normally the first step in doing that, and you'll see this in every single company, is that they will do something to convince you that their product is something you want. Now, let me explain what I mean. So back in the day, uh, I remember when I was a little kid, uh, I would always see McDonald's commercials. And of course, as a kid, who doesn't love McDonald's, right? You don't know what's in there, but you love it because it's fast food. So I love McDonald's. And I remember there was a time when their uh, logo or slogan, not the logo, the slogan changed. And, and you know, I don't even remember what the last one was, but all of a sudden it changed to uh, this little chime followed by I'm loving it. And I thought that's interesting, right? So here I am in this media class in high school and our teacher's telling us, hey, so, you know, she's telling us about how companies do this to convince you that you want their product. So then she goes, did you guys notice that McDonald's changed their, their slogan? I'm loving it. And I remember thinking, yeah, like it's weird though. It's kind of an interesting statement. The goal that McDonald's had in changing it is that because previous to this statement, Advertising was about, let me convince you that my product is a phenomenal product. After a while, companies realized this isn't necessarily changing sales. So instead, what they changed it to, check this, it's a psychological thing. They wanted you to say certain phrases until you started to believe them. In other words, they were playing a psychological game of if I can get you to think that you want this really badly, then you're gonna actually start believing that you want it. Thus the phrase, I'm loving it. Well, when you say the slogan, who's actually saying that statement? You are. And who are you saying it to? You're saying it about yourself. You're saying, I'm loving it. I love McDonald's. See where this is going? Can I tell you another one that's always stuck with me? Campbell's Soup. Campbell's Soup also, again, Campbell's, I'm just, this is just my opinion, okay? It's not law, but Campbell's Soup is okay. It's good, I get it, but it's okay. But their slogan was interesting because they changed that one also into Campbell's Soup mm -mm Good, which I know has been around for forever. But it's the, do you get it again? They're putting words in your mouth to convince you that this is actually something that you are craving and that you can't live without. <sighs> Pastor Johnny, where is this going? There are certain things in our Christian life in our life, in, in, in being believers, being people that go to church, that God is actually trying to transform and change. But 90% of the time, those transformations and those changes will not happen because we are convinced that our way of thinking is the only way of thinking. Eventually, what God is going to have to do, and what he eventually does, is he has to have a conversation with us where he has to tell us, listen, it's, it's, I'm trying to do something new. I'm trying to do something amazing. I'm trying to continue and further my kingdom. But you're stuck in either an old system, an old method, or maybe you're stuck in the, I, I, I like it my way. And maybe it's God trying to get you to say, say this with me, change, mm -mm, good. Until it gets to the point where you go, wait a second, every time, that God has changed something in my life, that God has transformed something, that God has brought me into something new, or he's taken me out of my comfort zone. Now that I think about it, hasn't it always been good? Hmm. And I use that as a reference to Genesis chapter one and two. When God created the universe, when he creates Adam and Eve, when he creates all the things that were functioning the way he wanted them to, they were good. So say this with me. 
change. Mm -mm, good. Now, where are we going to go with this? Is that I kind of got ahead of myself and kind of told you the whole point of the sermon. But I want to kind of give you the bigger picture of this is going to unpack a lot. What we're going to read today is Acts chapter 10. Now, if you have your Bible, okay, grab your Bible, and I want you to look at Acts chapter 10. And we are going to focus on certain passages. We are literally going to look at the whole thing. But if I read the whole thing, that's an entire chapter, and that's going to take a while. But I do want to kind of highlight what's going on, okay? So we have some characters. And remember, the book of Acts is focused on two people, technically three. What the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are doing. The characters that we are going to encounter are secondary. They're not primary, they're secondary. So it's always a watch and see what God is doing through his Holy Spirit because of what he's done through his Son. Okay, that's always the main focus. So let's read this together. Now, there was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion that was called uh, the a centurion that was called the Italian Regiment. Okay, and we stop there. Who is this guy? His name is Cornelius. We have that fact. He is a centurion. The word centurion means he is in charge of a hundred soldiers, right? That's his, you know, normal name. So we're identified by Luke. Here are the main characteristics of this man. He is a Roman soldier. He is, in fact, part of the Italian regiment, which also means he's a pretty big deal. But then also, he's not Jewish. And I need to highlight that. He is a Gentile. If any of you ever, ever asked the question, why is the word Gentile everywhere in the, in the New Testament? Gentile means non-Jewish person. Okay, So this guy in particular, not Jewish. And that's important because of what is about to happen. Now, he was a devout man and feared God along with his whole household. He did many charitable deeds for the Jewish people and always prayed to God. About three in the afternoon, uh, he distinctly saw a vision of an angel of God who came in and said to him, Cornelius, staring at him in awe, he said, what is it, Lord? The angel told him, your prayers and your acts of charity have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa. And call for Simon, who is also named Peter. He is lodging with Simon a Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, he called two of his household servants and devout soldiers, who, uh, who was one of those who attended him. After explaining everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So this is stage one, okay, or scene one, if you will. We have this Cornelius guy. He is a Gentile. However, notice what is already described about him. One. He's very charitable, which means he's practicing almsgiving. He normally gives out money to those who are in need. Secondly, he's praying. When he prays, he prays like a devout person, like as if he was Jewish, but he's not Jewish himself, nor could he be. Being a Gentile, unless you, you know, convert to Judaism, he hasn't. But obviously he has some sort of respect or honor for the God of the Jews. So he has this kind of almost there, not yet kind of, you know, relationship with God. An angel of the Lord appears to him in a vision. What's a vision, remember? It's not a dream. Those happen at night when you're asleep. This is full on. You are awake and you're seeing things happen before you in your imagination. He sees a vision. The angel says to him, I want you to know that your prayers have gone to God and he's heard you. Secondly, your charitable acts have become an offering. By the way, that is a sweet offering before the Lord. Now, you are going to send your men to this person, which is otherwise known as Simon, a.k.a. Peter. He is at Simon the Tanner's house. You are going to go there. What does he do? He grabs his men, tells them, sends them on his way, right? Why does this matter? I, and here's where the fun begins. I want you guys to notice something very unique. One, this is not a Jewish man. Two, he's also not a Christian. Three, whoever it is that he thinks he's praying to, the person who heard is God. This is where the fun begins, because now we have to, <laughs> it's one of those, okay, I'm trying to say too many things at once, so we'll start here. We have preconceived ideas of what it means to be church, what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be, you know, a, a religious person, whatever you want to call it. We have these preconceived ideas, and often when we read the Bible, we bring all of these preconceived notions, all these preconceived ideas and we implement them into the story that we're reading. By the way, that is called eisegesis, meaning I am not studying the scriptures and I'm not letting them form me and my opinion. 
I am forming them and I am putting my information over them to control the text that I'm reading. We cannot continue with this story unless you agree that you're willing to listen to the exegetical, not eisegesis, but exegesis, the exegetical understanding of this passage, meaning our agendas, our preconceived religious notions, our idea of what it means to be church, Christian, whatever the case is, all of those have to go into the dumpster. They have to. What we are allowed to take is whatever the scriptures want us to learn, whatever the scriptures want us to become, whatever ideas we have, if they conflict with scripture, then our ideas go to the dumpster and we now adopt the new ideas that scripture is forming. Why do I say that? Because this is exactly what's about to happen in this story. But it's going to happen on so many levels that as a Christian, this might be the one sermon that you're the most uncomfortable with. Because we are going to get into areas where we go, oh no, oh no, oh no, God is not sticking to the box that I put him in. This is a Gentile man. He's been praying. And automatically our Christian worldview says, the only way that God hears you is if you're a believer, if you have the right ideas about Jesus and the right ideas about God. The only way that God's going to hear you is if you have the right behavior and the right attitude, if you are living a life without sin. First off, so far in the book of Acts, none of that would agree with you. Secondly, are you telling me that when people pray, God hears? Yes. You mean like Jewish people? No, 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 no. When, when, if you're Jewish and you pray, God hears you, obviously. When you're Christian and you pray, still, God hears you. When you're atheist and you pray, when you're Muslim and you pray, when you are Buddhist, New Ageist, well, well, hold on, hold on, Pastor, you can't say that because those are other gods. What other gods? Again, easy on what you throw out so quickly. There is no other God in the universe. They may be praying to what they think is their God that does not exist nor has power. However, when people pray, God hears. This man is a Gentile. He does not have his act together. He is not living a certain life. He is not believing the right things. He is not, in other words, all the things that we perceive and assume as Christians is the only way that God would hear somebody pray. No, this text tells us God hears everybody and he will respond to anybody that he so desires in the way that he desires. He sends an angel, gives him a vision, and here God has already orchestrated. Mind you, Cornelius is not responsible for this story. Peter, which we will find out in the next scene, is not responsible for the story. None of these guys initiated this. This is all God-initiated work. So step one, God is already out of the box. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with the fact that God hears everybody's prayers? I hope so. If not, we're already going to get into some sort of issue. Okay, next, we keep reading. Pick up your Bible. (laughs) It says this. The next day, as they were traveling and nearing the city, Peter went up to pray on the roof about noon. He became hungry and wanted to eat. While While they were preparing something, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and an object that resembled a large sheet coming down, being lowered by the four corners to the earth. In it were all four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and the birds of the sky. A voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord, Peter said, for I have never eaten anything impure and ritually unclean. Again, a second time, the voice said to him, What God has made clean, do not call impure. This happened three times, and suddenly the object was taken up in heaven. Here's what happened. Peter goes up to prayer. By the way, it's normal for a Jewish man to pray three times a day. More specifically, if you are going to spend time in prayer, you're pointing towards the temple, wherever that is, regardless of where you are in the world. You want to point towards wherever the temple is, right? So here he is, pointing, praying, praying. Here we go. He, what, what time? Noon. It's normal at noon. However, he's on the roof, which means he can smell every house that's around him. And people don't just cook inside. They cook outside sometimes. So you can imagine you are 
on the roof. It is lunchtime and you're trying to spend time in prayer. And what is that beautiful smell that is hitting you? So what happens? He, he starts to get, he starts to get the growlies. He starts to get the, I'm hungry. My stomach is going, because as a result, he falls into this trance where he's probably somewhere between, I thought I was praying and now I'm hungry and now I'm getting angry. I don't know. It's just that I am not, I am not present right now. I'm, I'm in this other place. As he's in that moment, he sees a vision. Again, he's awake. He sees a vision. And it looks like a giant sheet that is, is brought down from heaven and all the animals, including, sorry, including the four-footed ones. Why is that such a big deal? Because there are Jewish regulations that say certain animals are not to be eaten because they are unclean. And what is he? Peter's a Jew. So he sees this sheet. And then what does he hear? God from heaven says, Peter, get up. That's a command. Kill, second command. Eat, that is a third command. I want you to notice the centurion's response to the angel. What did he say? Yes, Lord. What is the one phrase? By the way, this is the longest story in the book of Acts. That's in his entirety. Peter says the one phrase that shouldn't, it's, it's the most ironic phrase you will ever hear in scripture. No, Lord. I'm sorry, throw that one by me again. No, Lord. So, so, so what, why are we saying Lord? Because if Jesus is Lord, commander, chief, in charge of the universe, in charge of your life, the one showing you how to live, the one that's teaching you, the one that's guiding you, the one that's forming you, the one that is going to teach you right from wrong, he is the one that's going to, you know, he he's the one that gives you the yes or the no or the maybe. He is the one that you are waiting at. He's the one that you're waiting on. He is the one that is literally in charge of you. That's what Lord means. And if you're going to look at him and say, no, Lord, well, sabes que? Now he's not Lord. He's you can call him something else then. Teacher, rabbi, friend, you know, buddy. But he for sure isn't Lord if you're going to use the word no. Do you get where this is going? Upside down, Peter over here says, no, Lord. I w-. And why does he say no? Because he has a box. And in that box is the laws of Judaism. And that box says we do things a certain way. And God, you live in this box and you do things a certain way. And what is God saying? Go ahead, kill and eat. There's not an issue. There's no animal that you can... Go, go for it. And what is it? No, Lord, I wouldn't. I have never eaten anything that is unclean. How many of you know that God will bring up something over here because he's really dealing with something over here? Good. Three times. Three times that sheet is presented to him. Three times that voice says, don't you dare call something that God has considered clean, unclean. Don't. Do you want to know why it happened three times? Peter, and it's going to take too long to go through this, but go read the Gospels. Peter is told by Jesus several things three times because Peter has a hard time listening. He has a hard time perceiving. He has a hard time hearing. By the way, Peter's not the only one. If you read the entirety of Scripture, you will find out that when God does things in threes, it's because he's very serious about it. He is trying to go beyond the, I think I heard you. I think I understand. Oh, no, I understand. That's why he does it three times. So three times he tells Peter, stop it. If I have said it's okay, it's okay. If I said it's okay, it's okay. Say it with me. If I said it's okay, it's okay. Great. Peter at this point comes out of this trance and he does what all of us would have done. What was that? I don't understand. What was that? So he starts sitting there going, I don't. I don't get where the, and this is where I'm going to have to summarize the story for the rest of you guys, because it's going to take forever. Immediately as he's sitting there going, I don't get what was happening. Boom, there's a knock at the door. The knock at the door, boom, boom, boom. hey, we're here for, and the Holy Spirit, show, again, goes to Peter, hey, get up. Why do I have to get up? Well, you have to get up because the men that are downstairs are here for you. Go, quickly. Don't ask questions. Do not ask questions. Go. He runs downstairs, and who's waiting at the door? And immediately, Simon the Tanner's probably like, you're looking for who? For Peter? Uh, why? Like, why are you here? Peter just, hey, I, I got this. He shows up. He goes, hey, my name is Peter. You, you're you looking for me, correct? Yes, great, wonderful. Well, uh, we're going somewhere. The Holy Spirit is already informed. And they're like, yes, please. And what do they say? Peter, please don't hesitate. We need you to come with us right now, right away. He can clearly see that they are not Jewish. 
He goes with them anyway as they get to Cornelius' house. At this point, Cornelius has heard that Peter's on his way, so he invites his entire family. Let me repeat that to you again. His entire family. So the house is full, okay? So we have the whole house. Everybody's showing up. Cornelius is prepared as the servants and the soldiers are coming up. Immediately, Peter stops because the Jewish law says you are not supposed to enter the house of a Gentile unless you yourself will be declared unclean. Stops. That's where I want to continue reading with you this, okay? Oh, man. Um, where... <laughs> uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Verse 30. Okay. So Cornelius replied, Four days ago, at this hour, at three in the afternoon, I was praying in my house. Just then, a man in dazzling clothing stood before me and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your acts of charity have been remembered in God's sight. Therefore, send someone to Joppa and invite Simon here, who is also named Peter. He is lodging in Peter Tanner's house by the sea. So I immediately sent for you and it was good for you to come. So now we are all here in the presence of God to hear everything you have been commanded by the Lord. Peter shows up at the door, pauses at the door, right? And it clicks. Peter looks at Cornelius and says, I'm here. Remind you, still at the door. Why did you send for me? Like, what is my purpose here? I was not told the purpose. I was just told to come here without hesitation or question. But Cornelius, why am I here? To which Cornelius says, this is what happened. I got the vision. I got the angel. I got the, the and, and my whole family's here. And now we're here to hear, to hear whatever it is that the message that you've been told that you need to tell us. If you read this just section, just right before what I read to you, Peter says something beautiful. He goes, Cornelius, you are aware that I'm a Jewish man. You are aware that the laws of my people forbid me to walk into your home. And I bet you as he's saying this, he's literally taking one step into the house and slowly coming closer to Cornelius. And he's just saying, listen, it is unlawful for me to walk into your home. You know this and you know that it's, 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 it's part of the, but here's the deal. So God had a little conversation with me on the roof of the house while I was praying. And he said, I do not have the right to declare something unclean if he has made it clean. And now it makes sense to me that he wasn't talking about just food and just animals. He was talking to me about people. Can I tell you that this whole situation screams and yells, God, what are you doing? The law has already been established. The, the guidelines are there. It's the God. Stay in your lane. Stay in your box. What are you doing? God has completely ignored all the lanes. He's completely ignored the boxes. He is now setting up the situation for a Jewish man to walk into a Gentile house, and it is completely fine. Why? Because God just decided. How many of us gets super uncomfortable when God is about to do something new and the thing that he's about to do is not the way that we anticipated God to do it. And it's also not the way that we, we expected God to do it. And it's also not the timing. It's also not the, the method. It's not the, the reality. We played the scenario in our heads. We, we knew that there were certain things that needed to happen. And then God, what does God have the audacity to do? He just decides, you know what? I'm not going to play by any of those rules. Bam! I just did it in a brand new, out-of-the-box way. Can I tell you this in all sincerity? Never in my life have I seen God repeat something. And that should tell you something about your theology. Your theology should always say, God can always do something new. In fact, that's all he ever does. So for the, sometimes we get we get this idea of I've I've been a Christian for long enough like I know that this this is how we've always done it this is how we do things and then and then God does something outside of that and we sit there going no 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 wait, no 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 the way the way the way that it's supposed to we have two choices folks it's the exact same choice that the Israelites had with Moses you got two options either do you want to see the promise of God do you want to see God do new things do you want to see the kingdom come do you want to see his will be done do you want to see what God is going to do next yes and amen but just like the prophets have said look and behold which I believe is Isaiah look and behold I'm doing something new but 
Will you see it? Will you perceive it? Will you actually be okay with it? The Israelites did not get to go into the promised land. Why? Because God, you're forcing us out of our comfort zone. You're forcing us out of the place where we feel you should be playing in. And you've done jump the gate. And now it's the, I'm, on, I'm not over there. Here we have Peter is being shaped and reformed. Why? Because the kingdom of God has now been given to the Gentiles. This is a Gentile soldier of all things. The story's not done, by the way. We have to finish all the way to the end of the chapter. So when, again, summarizing, here we go. Peter is sitting there and he goes, you want me, I came here to tell you guys something? And he realizes, I know exactly what it is that they're, they want to hear about Jesus. That's what this, this is. So immediately Peter goes, all right, sermon time, let's go. And you guys can read this for yourself. It's, it's, it's found literally in verses 34 all the way to 43. He goes into, okay, so here's what happened in Jerusalem. He goes in, we met Jesus. We knew, we know we hung out with him. He did miracles. He did signs. The religious leaders hated him for it. They started pushing up, you know, forcing, you know, they were getting mad at, at the kingdom that was coming. So what they do, they decided the best thing to do was to kill him, but killing him didn't fix anything. In fact, God resurrected him because he's the Messiah. He's the one we've been anticipating and waiting. He goes, and he sent his Holy Spirit. And because it... Now, here's another one. You ready? Oh, I love this stuff. Because it forces us to ask the question, what really matters? Peter, is he started the sermon. He's going. He's literally telling them the gospel. He's telling them the gospel truth. He's telling them the story of Jesus. And as this whole Gentile family is sitting there, Peter doesn't get to do the altar call. He doesn't finish the sermon. If you guys read, okay, read verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, in other words, he's still preaching this sermon. The Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who, were, who, come, who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles where they heard them speaking in other tongues and declaring the greatness of God. And then afterward, what does Peter say? Peter responded, can anyone withhold water and prevent these from being baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Boom. God in a box. Okay, so let's break it down, okay? A couple things. Does Peter finish the sermon? No. Do you want to know why? Because sermons don't answer the things that we need. Yeah, you heard me right. You're like, Pastor Johnny, why would you say sermons are not the answer? You, you preach yourself. I do. And can I tell you something? Another sermon isn't going to change your life. Another good sermon is not going to change your life. It might convince you to do a thing or two. It might even make you feel good. It might even cause you to be like, oh, I'm going to rethink the way I'm thinking. Praise God. That's the Holy Spirit. But can I tell you what matters more than another sermon? You Interacting with God one-on-one. -on -one. Having an encounter with God always and forever will be greater than hearing a sermon. That is why it says, while Peter was still talking, the Holy Spirit said, okay, well, we're over this now, and just shows up and baptizes non-Jewish people. By the way, are we going to get a fight over this? Yeah, we are in the next chapter. But for right now, we're living here. And in this moment... God spoke to people that didn't even know were praying to him. He showed them visions, even though they didn't have their act together. He pours out his Holy Spirit, even though they didn't believe the right things or act the right way, or even they weren't even part of the family of God. Well, this gets engraving. Do you guys feel the tension in the room? You should. Because it's that tension of, I'm not comfortable with the fact that God is doing things in other ways. I'm not comfortable with the fact. This is what Peter, I mean, he hit the ground running on this one. He is literally experiencing these people speaking in other tongues, declaring the goodness of God, just like it did in the book of Acts. And they are not Jewish and they are not believers and they are nowhere near holy as they should be. Go ahead. Go ahead, do what I do at times. Argue with God and go, hey, you did this wrong. Hey, you you said, and these rules, and these, you know, it's supposed to be this way. 
Why does God respond every single time? That's cute. Thank you for your opinion. I do take it into consideration. Um, but I, I got it from here. Change. Mm -mm, good. God changed everything on Peter that day. God changed everything on, on this world that day. He opened up grace to an extension and to a degree that it is exponential and we have no way of measuring it. We do realize that. The extent that he's giving the Holy Spirit to Gentiles, the extent that he's giving the Holy Spirit to people who didn't have their lives together, the extent that he's doing this in a region that is nowhere near where Jewish people would be, he is, he's, he's over and over and over. He said that he listened to people's prayers and they didn't even know they were talking to him. He said, your, your charitable gifts have, have made me happy. How is that? You're, so that's just how we're doing things? Yeah, yeah, that's how we're doing things. That's how we've always done things, but you guys weren't aware. You are not aware that I'm always doing something new. Instead, you want to stick with only what you're comfortable. And Peter says, uh, <laughs> now we have a predicament. Normally, the expectation was they would get baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit would fall upon them. And the book of Acts tells us that never once does that pattern actually happen. One minute they're baptized and the Holy Spirit comes. The next minute they're baptized, the Holy Spirit doesn't come until somebody shows up. The next minute the Holy Spirit comes, there is no baptism. The other. May I make a suggestion? Can we throw away the boxes? Just remember I told you if we have any preconceived notions as Christians, can we just throw them in the dumpster? And let us let scripture form us. In this situation, Peter is letting God form him. Peter is letting Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father form him to have the capacity to extend the grace of God beyond his own imagination and beyond the rules and regulations that he thinks he still has to force God into. No, he is saying, God, you know what? It's, it's your, your kingdom come and your will be done as you would like it done however in the world you get this thing done. I am just a participant. I am here to listen and obey and to have a wonderful, loving relationship with you. But if you're going to surprise me left and right, then I might as well just get accustomed to it. Change. Man. Mm -mm, good. Can you say that with me? Change. Mm -mm, good. Ladies and gentlemen, what matters most of all is you interacting with God with you interacting with this Holy Spirit, with you having an encounter with Jesus. When we come to church, we think that the value is found in the serpent. No, the value is found in the person we encounter that is the person of Christ. That is the Holy Spirit dwelling within us and forming us. That is the Father who is reminding us who we are and whose we are. This is the reason why church exists, to create a space and an environment where we get to actually encounter God one-on-one. -on -one. And in that one-on-one, -on -one, he is going to make us so uncomfortable because he's going to do things that I'm not used to God. I like him in the bubble. I like him in the box. No, 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 no. There's no boxes here. There's, there's, it's just leave your boxes outside. How about that? When you come in here, let me be who I am because I am the I am. I think I've given you enough information for you to spend the next week mulling over and processing, oh my gosh, God, what are you doing? Grace and peace be with you. This is the way. Have an amazing day.